Why don't I want to know or feel my addictions? Hmm. It's a good question, actually, isn't it? If you think about it. Yeah. Is it rather than telling ourselves we do want to and then don't do it, we're better off finding out why we don't want to do it uh, than, than telling ourselves something that's not true. So what did you come up with as the reasons why you don't want to? Um, so Boris up here. So if Boris, you point the camera there and Corny will point the camera at you. Yeah, that's it. Um, well, there's a lot. Yeah. But uh, but basic, uh, what I've found was that uh, looking at my addictions reveals a feeling um, there's there's something wrong with me. Okay, there's something wrong with me, yep. So it's sort of like a, uh, how can we summarize that in a word or two? Well, I'll, I'll say it as you said it. There is something wrong with me, yep. yep. And uh, that feeling brings, a, so it's kind of like how I felt my whole life. Right, very good. Yeah, uh, which then uh, puts me in a state of rebellion. Good, because you, you're sick and tired of being told yep. there's something wrong with you, right? Yep. So, so you, uh, so you could say you're angry. Yes. About being told this. Yes. Yeah. Good. So then, uh, this makes me uh, shift the blame onto others. Good. So you get angry about being told this, and whoever tells you, of course, you want it's to get fault, angry yeah. with. Yeah. That yep. makes sense. Um, so, um, and I'm tired of feeling at fault. You, you, you so there's sort of almost an exhaustion of, I don't even know what's wrong with me, but I keep getting told what's wrong with me. And yeah. yeah, so it's sort of like a feeling of e exhaustion, shall we say? Yes. Uh, exhaustion. Uh, yeah. um, about the accusation, about being told. And most people tell you to pull you down, let's face it, don't they? They're not telling you to make you feel better about yourself or something like that. They're telling you to pull you down and make you feel worse about yourself. And so, of course, you, you're going to feel like if anybody tells you what's going on, you're going to start feeling the same way with them. Yep. Good. Yep. Um, and uh, so avoiding it makes... Should I go into that? Like it makes me feel control, that I have control. Okay, so the feeling of avoiding mm -hmm. makes you feel like you've got a bit of control over your life. Yeah. So it results in control. Yeah. You feel like, oh, this gives me some sense of control. If, you, if I stop listening to what anybody tells me about what's wrong with me, then at least I have some form of control over preventing these attacks, what feels like an attack. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Go on. Go. What others did you have? Just hold the mic up. They're, they're in, in my phone. I turned that off. I just dragged down some things. So I um, uh, can't quite remember what they are now. That's okay. Um, but they're the other ones you listed when you were working through the issue, like yeah. trying to work yeah, out. The with biggest it. thing I noticed was rebellion. It's, a, it's, a, it's like that constant feeling when I was a, when I was a kid. I was I was told that I was I was wrong, and I felt that the motivation wasn't loving. And also, oftentimes, you were right. Yeah. <laughs> so that right. makes it worse. Right, and now I'm confused when I'm right and when I'm wrong. Exactly. So, so Most people are confused, actually, yeah. uh, because, because oftentimes, they felt they were right, but they were being told they were wrong. Yeah. So when they were a child, yep, mm -hmm. I agree. Good I? That's a good start. Now, if we switch those cameras around. <laughs> Who else would like to have a go? Scott, thanks. So I came up with I'd rather feel angry because that um <laughs> so right, so right to go back to the notes. This is a very good because when I'm angry I, I get to feel justified in not taking responsibility for my life that I get to stay a victim. 
Okay, so this is like a, it's almost an addiction to stay the victim, like to be, to feel like you're the victim for the rest of your life of what other people have done. So, right. so desire to stay a victim, yeah. And it, I realize it gave me an out to deny that God is perfect and that all of God's gifts are perfect. Good, so it's sort of, um, in, in what way did it give you the out? I, I understand where you're coming from. I, I don't know if the audience does, that's all. Well, yeah. I was basically convincing myself that I was right and God is wrong. Good, so I am right. <laughs> God's wrong. Very good. Yep. You mentioned one to me when you came and talked to me before uh, about a half an hour ago that I feel is probably the real crux of the issue. Do you remember what you said? At the moment, no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get there eventually then, with, with the help of others. Can you remind me? <laughs> um, what we'll probably do is we'll go around to different people and find out why they feel the way, same way. But, but eventually we're going to get, we're actually going to get down to one major problem, one major childhood emotional problem. And it's the emotional problem that you actually talked about with me before the session began. You can't remember that, what, what that was? No, I feel like a deer in the headlights right now. No, that's now. okay, that's okay. Um, we'll get to, we'll, I will mention it. So, so if you do remember, put up your hand again. and Because and in the end, you raised it with me uh, actually a half an hour ago or so. Yeah. Okay, so that, um, Robin, you want to have a go? Yep. Um, I think most of my addictions are because I don't want to feel uncomfortable in any way. As soon as I start to feel uncomfortable, then I go into some addictions. And, okay. Or, get, I'm, or I'm afraid and I get confused. I don't even know why I'm... I don't even really know what's under the uncomfortable because I'm so afraid of it. Yep. I would say that is more about what are your addictions than why do I not want to know what they are. Oh. Does that make sense? Um, now, there is a link to comfort that we will get back to because it is a very big issue regarding our childhood. This, this whole issue actually comes back to some very primary emotions in our childhood about, and, and can I mention what they are? Rather, <laughs> it's, a, it's about feeling like feeling emotions is pointless. And remember what you said. Can you remember? Let's hand the mark back to the man. <laughs> so if we can come back to Scott now, because I think um, you remember now what you were saying to me. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I had a realization today. I was just talking with, with Julian about um, how when we're kids, our parents are constantly projecting you know, anger and fear at us. Yep. And we get, you know, our experience is that there's no end to it. Yep. And for many of you, it still hasn't ended, as, as we discussed. Like, for most people, even when they become adults, the parents are still projecting the same fears and still projecting the same anger that they were projecting all of our life at us. So there, there has been no end. Right. And then, where did you go with that? Can you remember? And that also, that the spirits also kind of, fill that role and they're projecting at us and we're feeling spirits emotions so we still have this feeling that emotions are endless and they never end and what's the point exactly so when you start feeling that emotions are endless and never end what's the point can you see that you almost then start going to yourself I need my addictions in order to cope with all this crap that coming at me all the time in my life. Now, if you think about your childhood, you've got all this stuff coming at you all of the time, and there's one other quality about your childhood that, that reduces as we get to an adult generally, although they're not always, as we've pointed out. But uh, what's that? What, what happens if we... Um, a sense of powerlessness, because as a kid, we're, we're sort of a victim of our environment, and as we get older, we tend to have a little bit more freedom and say in, in our choices. Correct. So in, when we're a child, we're getting all this crap projected at us. 
we can't leave we can't avoid it usually we tried anger by the time most people are two years old they're already trying anger actually as a method of avoiding it and what happened with anger when you tried anger when you were two generally you got smacked you got so you got violently abused and that was your only protest that was your only protest and and my, for most people the terrible twos gets beaten out of them like in terms of a in terms of a violent response from parents and so now what we're talking about is now not only do we have we learned that we're going to have this barrage of emotions we've also learned that we can't get away from it there's nothing we can do we've just got to sit in the in the whole stew of it and then on top of that whenever we try to you know project back at the parents that it's not on that it's not right that we feel it's unjust we and we get angry of course when we do that as a child the parents now also on top of that smacking us and and violently abusing us so what do we learn there we learn that any expression of uh, our feelings about the projection coming at us from the world needs to be squashed suppressed and so after that what we try to do then and this is how we learn addictions we learn that there's ways to manipulate the situation to avoid some of these projections that's what we learn so so this usually is well established by the time we're three years old actually right and in fact most children by the time they're three years old have become very good manipulators of events with regard to their family situation and so forth in an attempt to avoid feeling all these terrible feelings that that they they know they can't feel because even when they try to cry about it they get usually smacked or abused in some way or rejected in some way if they verbally go into rage about it they also generally get smacked or abused in some way or rejected in some way if they go into any other type of protest about the emotion other than a subversive controlled manipulative type of protest they will have an overt response and so what do they do they decide the only form of protest that's possible is to go to feel what the addiction is in the parent or in the environment feed the addiction in order to alleviate the response does that make sense now most of you learned to do that by the time you were three years old you learned to do that emotionally before you could even think clearly does that make sense this is why a lot of your addictions are confusing to you because you actually learned most of them before you could think now a child's brain is generally fully developed by the time it's like mostly fully developed and saying you know 90 percent fully developed by the time of seven years of age so from the time from three to seven years of age you weren't actually learning how to deal with these emotional abuses in your life through some kind of you know intellectual process you were learning how to do it just by responding emotionally responding emotionally to every event and every event you responded emotionally to any that you got punished or shut down from you learned that was not the appropriate response and there's no way that you could clearly think about that right because you didn't have a fully developed intellect where you could go oh no my mum and dad's wrong actually right there was this acceptance of this kind of behavior and of course then you go to school generally by the time in the western world by the time we're four years of age we're going to kindergarten or i don't know what you call that preschool uh, you probably call it here um, and then we're talking from the time of four to the time of seven now you've got the additional controls of schooling that also bring us back into line as what's acceptable socially what is not acceptable socially and so forth and so that's already also controlling us and this is all still happening before we have a completely formulated mind-based idea about what's going on so can you see why you don't want to face your addictions <laughs> uh, it's a pretty they're pretty big reasons aren't they can you see that yeah Jen? it almost feels like it's survival of my whole life exactly it is survival 
the reality is that when you, with this childhood stuff, it was survival. You, it, it, you were placed into a situation where you learned the only method to survive was to feed addictions and have addictions fed. Does that make sense? Don't go into your fears. Don't go into your grief. Don't, like You learned at a very young age not to go into your grief. You learned at a very young age not to feel any anger, generally. You learned at a very young age to suppress both grief and anger. You learned at a very young age that every time you felt afraid, generally someone made fun of you or abused, you know, like, humiliated you. So you learned to not do that either. So what's left after all that? Get your addictions met through any form of control possible. That's what's left. That's how our addictions came to be. Right? Can you see that? So this all starts with that process and then we end up with these beliefs. There must be something wrong with me. You're angry about being told there's something wrong with you all the time. You're exhausted about being told with no clear concept or way of how to fix it. You're never told how to fix it generally. You're only told there's something wrong, right? No one tells you how to fix it. And so you go into control to avoid the process of all this crap that's coming at you. And then, of course, this desire to stay a victim also begins because it's sort of like we believe we're a victim. And the reality is when we're a child, we are. <laughs> right? So that, that, it, that becomes a truth in our childhood generally, that we are a victim of everybody else's projection and everybody else's crap and everybody else, uh, what they do and say and feel about us. And every time we try to process, somebody shoves us back down again. And so in the end, we do believe we're a victim because we are. We are a victim of all this crap coming at us. And then we revert to feelings like this, like, don't tell me that I've now got to go back to my emotions. Every time I ever went back to my emotions, I just got abused. Don't, and God's, and what, what I'm saying to you is God's way is to actually connect emotionally to everything. You get, don't tell me that. Like, how dare you tell me that? Every time I try to connect emotionally, when I was a child, what happened to me? Look at what happened to me. What happened to me is I got abused more, I got punished, sometimes violently. You know, all these bad things happened to me every time I did that. So don't tell me, go back to my emotions. I just want some addictions met. That's all I want now. <laughs> it's the feeling, right, inside of us. And that's why we don't want to know or feel our addictions. Because we have all of these belief systems that, that were true during our childhood and we've grown up with them and because they were all formulated before we our brain was even fully developed most of us don't even realize that we have all these feelings that were formulated that have become what I would classify as beliefs does that make sense they are now beliefs they we believe them to be true. And then some idiot comes along claiming he's Jesus for a start. And then secondly, saying, you've got to do it exactly the opposite way of that. You go, don't be stupid. Like, how dare you say that that's the case? Because my experience through my whole childhood has been exactly the opposite. So everything screaming at you, saying, no, everything AJ is talking about here is actually wrong. That's the feeling the child has. The child inside of you has this feeling. That everything I say about going back to emotions and dealing with emotions and facing your addictions and deconstructing your addictions, all of that is wrong. It's not going to work. It never worked all through my life. And when we say all through my life, what we really mean is it never worked through all of my childhood. It never worked. And because it never worked then, it means that that's real. That means that, that I'm right. It means that it's never going to work. All right? And can you see there's also a fair bit of anger in that feeling, isn't there? Like, 
you can feel the anger in that kind of feeling. Going, Don't tell me things that are never going to work. I have had a personal experience with this. I have lived, and even if you're only 15 or 16 years of age, <laughs> you, you, you have lived 15 or 16 years of age, and the entire per period of time generally has been telling you the exact opposite of trying to get into emotions or, or into feelings or facing your fears or feeling your addictions. You, all you want to do, really, internally, all that we want to do is create more addictions. That's the feeling we have. Scott? So I just realized the connection between uh, having the intellectual, like, yeah, this, this is the best thing I've ever learned in my life. Yep. But emotionally feeling hopeless. Exactly. Exactly. So whenever anybody starts hearing divine truth, which is God's way of dealing with things, we automatically go, there's a soul-based attraction to it sometimes of, wow, that's what's happened to me type of attraction, an acknowledgement of what's happened, which, by the way, feels good. You know, when I acknowledge to you what's happened to you in your childhood, you feel good about that. But at least somebody's acknowledging what happened in your childhood. But then you also feel bad because I'm saying that God's way is the reverse of what you've now learned. Right? And then, so everybody then feels bad and hopeless about that way because all they ever experienced through their childhood was the feeling of hopelessness about how to get away from these projections and emotions. And if you're honest with yourself, the majority of you feel like pretty hopeless about it. And to be honest you would be far better feeling hopeless for a little while about this issue of addictions than worrying about even getting to one of them. Does that make sense? Just feeling the actual emotion that everything is hopeless and that emotion was created in your childhood usually by the time you were three years old. Right? This is why most of us feel hopeless when it comes to dealing with our emotion. Does that make sense? Does that help with understanding why? Right. So, what can we do about that? <laughs> like, it's a pretty big ingrained belief, isn't it? In fact, you would have to say that it's probably one of our primary ingrained belief systems that most of us would have. And what I... It's very rare, I've found, for anybody to not have that underlying belief system that it's hopeless going in that direction. Like, I've not met anybody who doesn't have that belief. And you can understand why. Everybody generally, unless you've grown up in a perfectly loving environment and a perfectly loving school system, um, it's pretty unlikely that you're not going to have that belief ingrained within you as a part of your very feeling of, of, you know, your very nature even now, it feels like. So naturally, once we've got this belief, we are going to now, basically, we're going to go, what is the point of actually finding any addiction? What I really want to do instead of finding any addiction is I just want to get all of my addictions met. Right? And this is why seminars that tell you how to get all your addictions met usually have thousands of people attending them. Because <laughs> that's really all we want to know. How do we get in another addiction met? How do we come away from something feeling good? And this is, the, this is the conundrum most people have with the seminars I present, is that they sometimes come away from the seminar feeling bad. And they go, that doesn't feel very nice. It feels like AJ just destroyed my perception of myself here. That doesn't feel good. That feels bad. And then a lot of people go one step further than that. Now they're angry with me for doing that. And then they go, that's what AJ does. He's a cult leader that just basically destroys the self-perception of people so that they all just follow him in the end. And if you have a look on the average internet forum about me at the moment, you'll find that that's the average negative comment. Right? And the main reason why we feel those particular things is because we don't understand 
that we have this belief inside of us that was established at a very very young age that it is pointless going down this road of dealing with emotions pointless it gets so bad as an adult even that the average person who goes down the road of trying to deal with some emotions is usually put on medication right and the average person who goes down the road of dealing with emotions wants to be put on a medication <laughs> right that's why the pharmaceutical industry has so many forms of medication that you can have to help you suppress your emotions right ranging from like hard drugs such as valium and those kind of things things that knock you out completely right the way through to antidepressants antipsychotics and so forth all helping you avoid the feelings that you have right? and the average person on the planet wants those options because we have this hopeless feeling about it's impossible for me to work through my emotion and get clear of this particular stuff because it's just going to be forever a barrage at me anyway the world is just going to keep barraging keep barraging me i'll deal with all of this and in the end the world's just going to keep barraging me with all their crap anyway i won't be happy in the end i'll just be more sensitive to the barrage right? and i think it would be fair to say babe wouldn't it in your feelings of resistance to everything that's happened in the six years since you've known me this would be the biggest single emotion that you've had to work your way through definitely yeah uh, not only the f it's been the feeling that if i stop doing what i've if i stop doing what i've done normally it, would do addictive yeah. wise yeah, yeah everyone will attack me yeah. not one person everyone, everyone the world will attack me yeah. and secondly because in my family i was never me feeling emotions was distressing for the people around me so they did a lot of things i learned very early that i shouldn't feel because they don't they don't feel good when i don't feel good exactly. and my job is actually to make them feel good so it also gave me a feeling that i by the time i was three i thought i'd lost any confidence in my ability to feel an emotion also mm -hmm. because i hadn't had that experience mm -hmm. of, of feeling sadness on my own or feeling anything i suppressed it all so yeah. there's a feeling that if i stop doing this they'll get angry at me yeah and and actually now i don't even know if i can feel anything yeah 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 and and because of that um, when we met there was this big feeling in you wasn't there of, don't tell me i've got to go to an emotion um, don't even tell me what the emotion is i don't even want to know that isn't it that was pretty much the response definitely and mm. then uh, then just terror you know that was the angry response and yeah. then i'm still working through terrors of giving up some addictions because yes. of I just perceive disaster. Yeah. yeah. Disaster oh, will be the result of feeling your emotions. Yes. If yeah. giving up, just giving up the addiction will result in disaster. Yeah. Obviously, I've had some experience where I've challenged that belief and, and, and had. It's not true. It's anymore. not true. Yeah. yeah which yeah. gives you more faith to keep going. Of course. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 Um, I. I was doing some processing the last day or so right mm -hmm. up to today yeah around 11:30, i thought you know you better get to work and just find out right and started exploring more and i went right through that whole hopeless cycle yeah and um challenging you in 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 my own mind yeah. going you know a, exactly what you said yeah. it went through my mind and and my feelings yeah you know and and you should just go home yeah uh, you can do all this at home yep. right and then i got physically sick yeah like i was so i was i so didn't want to come here <laughs> at two o'clock yeah. that i actually got physically sick yeah to stop myself from having to come and face this yeah um yeah. through that whole process yeah and that's I mean, very what common. you've described is exactly what i went through yeah right and then yeah like like oh i can't go now yeah i can't go i yeah. gotta i'm gonna stay in bed yeah and uh it's incredible okay. yeah yeah it's, <laughs> it's just incredible so yeah. thank you thank you yeah when we examine this actually 
to, to be frank with you, before you get to your addictions, the majority of you are going to find that this is going to be what needs to be de deconstructed first. The belief system surrounding why you feel it's pointless. Right? And, and, and it is the feeling that is point, the pointless feeling that actually drives a lot of these hopeless feelings that you have and also finishes up driving a lot of your needy feelings. This is one of the, the result of these pointless feelings is that you would feel then that I should tell you what the emotion is rather than you have to discover it by yourself. Right? So many of you have projected that at me in the last five days already where you feel I have to tell you and if I don't tell you, you're instantly angry with me. And I'm saying, no, I don't, I'm not going to tell you. In fact, I've said no to quite a number of you already. I'm not going to ha have this interaction with you. What I would like to see you do instead is to work through the actual issue, which is this covering problem that everybody has about their addictions. And that is their belief is that basically it is a pointless and hopeless exercise to find out anything about any emotion because you are still going to receive the barrage of it for the rest of your existence. So what is better is just to try to get all of your addictions met and that way you can have some kind of semblance of a happy life. That's basically the underlying belief system. And, and as soon as somebody starts talking about developing a desire even to deal with your addictions, instantly their soul-based feeling is switch that off, block that out. <laughs> even some of you go, close that out and you go to sleep even right when we start talking about the emotions associated with addictions and the reason why is because there is so much motivation inside of us telling us and screaming at us actually saying don't go there you tried going there at, a, at, at an age you can't even remember and look what happened Yeah, I remember going through a feeling of if I give up these addictions, I'm never going to feel good ever again. That's no. it. This is the only way I feel any good in my life. Yeah. And if I give this up, well then what's the point? What's the point of even living? living. In fact, I it's find that people facing this issue eventually have a lot of suicidal thoughts actually. They feel like, well, if, if we're being told that the only way to God is to actually start facing the addictions, which are the only way that I get any happy feelings whatsoever, then what is the point of living? Right? The only problem with that thought is that if you do kill yourself, you're still living and you'll still be faced with the same problem. That's the only problem I, with that I, thought. I remember <laughs> having that dialogue in my brain. Of yeah. like, there's no point, what's the point, I've got to give this up. I know the truth, I can't deny and, the truth. And but we're I can't even angry that we can't suicide yes. and get away from it. <laughs> it's just going to be the same there. Exactly. What can I do? Yeah. yeah. And that is how many of us actually feel. If you're honest with yourself, that's how many of us feel. Al. I've actually realised pretty recently that I was only living in my sleep state that my awake state is actually a mere means uh, to getting me from one sleep state to another sleep state. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll say again that it's not very funny, actually. No, but, but it's I, true. I, I, don't, I don't do anything nice in my life. There is nothing that I like. And if it wasn't for my son, I guess I, I, I wouldn't be bother. there. But I mean, I came to the same realization that you, you can't do away with your life at all <laughs> you're yeah. stuck there but yes it, and it's pretty frightening because then you're just asking yourself what the hell do I do in this sleep state that uh, actually keeps you going exactly so, and, uh, so there must be a lot of addictions being met there right wow. <laughs> terrible yeah and this is what I also find is that is that um, the, you can understand in a way why people get angry with me right because I'm telling them on one hand that God's way is this a way to emotional openness which, which the internal belief of the child inside of us is basically it's hopeless, it's a pointless way, it's never going to work, that's the internal belief. And then the alternative which most people wanted even in their childhood sometimes was they just wanted to die to get away from the whole crap that's happening 
And that's the alternative that many of us feel is an option, option even as an adult. This is why there is so many suicides in the planet. It's an angry response to feeling hopeless. And, and so that's suicidal thoughts. And then I tell you that if you're suicidal, it's going to actually get worse. So, so now I've told you. <laughs> Does that make sense? So, so I'm not only telling you that you've got to deal with all these emotions and everything, which is completely the opposite thing to what you grew up experiencing, but now I'm telling you that the only other option that you considered is actually going to make things worse and not better. And so, so in the end, a person often feels totally trapped. And if you're honest with yourselves, many of you feel this. Many of you have listened to Divine Truth now for a, long, a longer period of time, you know, through two, three, four years, and those of you who have feel quite trapped because you know that it feels like the truth to you. But on the other hand, there's all these belief systems going on inside of you emotionally. Does that make sense? Telling you, how can I go there? I can't go there. And, and then the only other option is get rid of myself, but I can't get rid of myself either. So now I've got no option but to go there, but, but that feels completely hopeless. You see? If we go... That's exactly how I feel. Um, and it actually, the feeling of that feels for me to where um, Boris was explaining when we get to that place of feeling hopeless, just as hopeless when we were as a child, of all these emotions coming at you, mm -hmm. and you feel like you have no control to get away from it. Yep. And it's that exact same feeling. Mm -hmm. So then it's back to addiction to get any semblance of feeling good. Yes. Addiction was the only thing that worked when you were a child. It was the only thing that worked. Right? Your anger usually didn't work. Your, you know, the feeling of your fear didn't work. The feeling of any grief didn't work. The only thing that generally worked to give you some semblance of peace internally and some semblance of peace from the projection, the only thing that worked was to revert to the addiction and so now I'm saying that doesn't work and everyone's screaming like going what what how could you say that doesn't work that's the only thing that's ever worked my entire life so how can you then say that that doesn't work and 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 what what a lot of people then do you see I'm telling people that the way to God so God's way is the exact way that you don't believe in from an emotional perspective. It's exactly the opposite way that you were taught as a child, basically. Now, when I tell them that this is God's way, there's only two possible feelings that a person will have after that point. And one is, it's not God's way, it's AJ's way, and AJ's an idiot, right? That's one. Or they believe me and, and do believe it's God's way, and so then they feel angry with God that God created that way. Does that make sense? Usually it's one of those two responses. It's either anger with me or anger with God. One of the two, right? And you can understand that too, can't you? Because it's sort of like it's the total opposite of what you've grown up with. It's the total opposite of what's happened in your life. It's the total opposite of what you've learned to address. And so naturally, there is the general response is it can't be true. And if it can't be true, then why am I listening to this person who claims he's Jesus anyway? that's one option and then the other option is if it is true then God's a shit <laughs> right that's the other option isn't it for creating such a terrible terrible way the other two options really that we feel and this is why we have so much anger towards God and and anger also as a subsequent result even towards religion because if any of you hear the word Jesus, you don't just think of the man, you think of all of the things that associated with Jesus' movement, right? Which is all to do with Christianity and so forth. So then there's so much anger about religion and so forth. And even the people who are in these religions, you start telling them they have to deal with an emotion, they get angry. Right? They want it to be what? They want the sacrifice of Jesus to magically take away the sin of the world and don't have to deal with anything. That's the core tenet of the belief system. So, so their very, the very belief system that gets constructed from Christianity came from this belief, this childhood belief that 
It's not God's way to do that. It's God's way to do what I am already doing, and that is learn how to manipulate the system through my addictions. That's what we start to feel. It's the only way that works. It's the only way that's satisfying. It's the only solution to the problem. Now, for, the, for, for each of you, there is that feeling inside of you. And if you can get in contact with that feeling and feel your way through all of the flavours of that feeling and understand where it came from, you will trace it back to many childhood events that taught you that this is the truth. And to me, that's where your emotional processing begins. Does that make sense? That's where you start. You start with this feeling that you don't want to know or feel your addictions and feel about why. That's where you start. That's the best place to start for the majority of people. So if you feel stagnant or blocked, the best place to start is with this terrible, hopeless feeling that you have that if you deal with addictions, you'll have no tool left to have any kind of a happy life. If you let go of all your addictions, there'll be no way that you can get happiness anymore. And it's a terrible, hopeless feeling when you let yourself feel it. Yeah. Um, in addition to hopelessness and uh, pointlessness, some people, like my ex-husband, who had been involved in the mental um, um, system, yep. <laughs> was terrified that it was actually very dangerous and so yes. that's that whole other component component can you see why we believe the childhood belief is that it is dangerous though it's very simple to see isn't it because if you if you look at this dangerous belief about emotions you, you can see very easily where it must have come from because when we were ch children generally if it wasn't anger at least that we got from somebody whenever we got out of hand emotionally, generally it was a abusive, violent punishment that we received. Right? At the hands of the very people who told us that they loved us. Right? And so of course there is going to be this very strong link inside of our soul to feeling that it is very dangerous to go there. Very dangerous because it's going to result in our abuse at some point. That's what we're going to feel. I was also thinking um, about this in terms of the um, mental health system. Yeah, um, which you were in for quite a long period of time. Which I worked in, yeah. Um, the, which is sort of ironic, isn't it? But anyway... <laughs> um, a lot of people feel it's dangerous to feel emotions because they've been taught in their early childhood that they're not able to cope with them. Mm -hmm. And so this immediately means that they try, an emotion comes up for them and they try to get away from it, mm -hmm. um, which enables spirits to engage with them in mm -hmm. their emotions. And very quickly people begin to look psychotic. Mm -hmm. um, and it also happens because people have been so frightened or damaged in their childhood that they've actually left their body in order to escape something terrible happening. Yep. And, but this has made them very... They've felt like that was a rescue. And so then they're open to more and more spirits um, Correct. coming into them and creating this huge openness to them. Then many of them end up in institutions. Correct. And so I feel like there's a lot of beliefs when people think it's dangerous to feel emotions, we're all going to end up in, in a mental institution. In a mental do, institution. Which there's is an sad indictment of humanity in the end. Yeah, go on. it is. <laughs> yeah. But there's a lot of big, big fears and terrors in there of like, I can't cope, bad stuff's, you know, not just going to happen to me at the hands of the people around me, but other but influences. Psychotic bad stuff is yeah, going to happen to me. Yeah, will happen. And, and I many know don't understand the linkage between spirits and psychosis. So exactly. they feel that it's something to do with a mental illness. Yeah, and I know you and I have had discussions very recently about um, some core blocks of a fear of being alone when I feel, a fear of just being able to cope with the intensity of emotion, all of those things that then leave us very open. To, to ending up in a mental institution. To, yeah, yeah, other people saying, you aren't coping, are you? And you're saying, I'm not coping. And then you end up 
on medication. So does everyone understand that? If you've got a feeling coming out of you, I'm not coping with my emotion, I'm not coping with my emotion, and everyone around you says, we've got to help them cope with their emotion, what's going to be the next step for everyone around you? We're going to force a way upon them where they're going to be able to cope with their emotion. So throw a bit of medication down them, put them in a mental institution until they're coping with their emotion again, until they're stable. Right? If you have a feeling in you that you want to share your emotion with other people, right? because you can't cope with it yourself, what's going to happen? You'll feel this feeling of share, sharing, which is out of harmony with truth, so you're going to actually attract people who want to share emotion with you, but the problem is, if you're not sharing it exactly the way they think you should be sharing it, you're straight away exposing yourself to involving other people in your emotional experience. Now, if they're not happy with you involving them in your emotional experience, they get confronted by the emotional experience in some way, where are you going to end up? Probably in the same institution. Does that make sense? There's all these things that go on inside of us that cause us to end up in places like that that are all to do with our addictions, actually. But we don't realise that because we have all these other beliefs that are so powerful and are so terrifying to us that we don't even realise what are the major causes of us ending up in an institution, for example. Right? And these kind of emotions, everybody then goes, well, it's all very, very dangerous situation. What AJ is doing is very dangerous. And in fact, I've heard some people say that to me. They say, what you're doing is very dangerous. I had one religious man even say that to me. What you're doing is very dangerous. You're opening people up to a can of worms that they can't cope with that they won't be able to cope with and they'll end up in mental institutions and it will be all your fault. Right? This is what they've said. And this is all because of these childhood belief systems associated with why we want our addictions met and why we don't want to have to do anything else other than that. Yeah. So now that you understand what's going on, how are you going to address that? Is there any ideas about that, Enrico? Uh, when I did the exercise, I found that my addictions covered fear. And even though you promise great things from God's way, I wondered why do I prefer my addictions, and it's because my fear was greater than my desire. Yeah. And so I listed some fears and um, felt some of that feeling of I can't do it. Yeah. And what I came to, the, the pattern that emerged was that I don't really have much faith. Yeah. I don't believe the process. It, it feels like jumping into a pit that I can't get out of. Yes. And so what it basically came down to was my relationship with God. And that if I worked on that, my trust and faith would grow and I would think it was possible. But, but because of how I see God and view him as punishing the Catholic belief, yeah. It just seems like um, I'm kind of alone in all of this ugliness and I don't really have much help. And even though you say it and it sounds true and good, it just, it just sounds like... Um, sounds like a crock of shit. Yeah, yeah, and it's very scary to step forth. Even though I, I say I believe you, it's very scary to take that step. Yep. But I felt if I, the solution would be working on my relationship with God and if that built up faith and trust in me, then maybe I could take the steps. Yeah, so let's begin with this uh, issue of faith. What would you say we currently have faith in at the moment? Well, well yeah, let's, let's be more specific. We have faith in our addictions. I would agree with that. We believe that they are the only things that work. They're the only things that bring us happiness. They're the only things that bring us any sense of fulfillment in our day-to-day -day life. They're the only things that we feel will ever be the result, that will ever give us a sense of being a part of the world and, and knowing ourselves and all these other things that we're all wanting to have. So at the moment we have faith in our addictions. What else do we have faith in? Anything else? Well, most people don't get that far, I don't feel. So... So the, the, uh, the, quest, the thing was fear, and I don't feel people get that far. If we come down to Nina. What else do we have faith in? What our parents taught us. Okay, so we have faith in, what would you call that, what our parents taught us? 
So we have faith in the beliefs that were constructed that we currently have. And they are beliefs about fear, about emotions, about feelings, about you know what's going to stop people from projecting at me and all these other beliefs, even beliefs about God are all in amongst there. We've got faith in these beliefs. They're not the beliefs of God that I'm sharing with you. They're completely opposite of those things most of the time, right? Our parents abused us. We, taught, we come to feel that that's how God is. God's abusive too. And in fact, many of us have faith that actually, because God made this way emotional, that means God's a bastard. So we actually have faith that God's a bastard, not faith. If God exists, is, is the comment of many people on earth, if you think about it, if God exists, then God's a mongrel. Because look at the world around us, look at the mess we're in. God's a mongrel if God exists. And so many people don't even believe God exists because of the world that we see around us, which all comes from our faith in all of these addictions and false beliefs, right? Anything else, Julie? So we have faith in being self-reliant. We only have faith in self-reliance, yes? We don't even have faith anymore, most of us, in relying on family or friends. In fact, the majority of us have a very, very uh, loose definition of family and friends, if you think about it. Because the majority of us don't have a strong faith that our family or friends will even care for us. Uh, we want that to happen most of the time. That's our addiction. But how many times has it happened in our past? Not very frequently. Whenever the chips are down, what happens? Everyone seems to scatter, right? That's been our experience. And that was also our experience in our childhood often. We were totally alone bearing the barrage of everything else. That's what we felt. Totally alone. Right? It's a terrible sense of loneliness. Hello. Oh, actually, I'm noticing that... Um I'd rather keep my addictions because they help me be in touch with people, even if I see in those people those same addictions that we are mutually satisfying. Yep. But if I don't do that anymore, I will lose a, the few of the friends. And So um, could it, would it be fair to say that we have faith in society definitions? Because it, it assures some sort of cohesion actually between me and the others and otherwise I would be just totally by myself and nobody totally. would ever either understand me or want to be with me. Correct. Correct. That's what we feel. So we believe that. We believe that wholeheartedly. Lawrence? Well, this falls under the category of beliefs, but I've had a tremendous belief for many, many years that there's, um, it's really correct to override my emotions. Yes. That that's God's way. And that's the good and right thing to do. Yes. And that it's a powerful thing. It brings me good feelings. It's good for the whole world. Yes. Yeah. We well, think it's good for others, good for us. Yeah. Yep. Um, how many of you watch Star Trek? The, so what's the one we're watching? Star Trek Enterprise. How many of you watch that? You know, the, the girl in it is called? Tapal the Vulcan. Tapal the Vulcan. Right? So what's the Vulcan belief? Get your emotions under control. It's good for the world, good for you. <laughs> good. You know, there's that makes belief. Makes you logical. And makes you logical. Makes you logical. It actually makes you totally illogical, actually. But it's very interesting how we see all of these things, right? Yeah. And this is a very important thing. Lawrence? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. You, you'd agree with that? The Vulcan sign. Your Vulcan sign. <laughs> <laughs> how many of us are Vulcans? <laughs> Pretty much all of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just without the pointy ears. <laughs> okay, we go straight behind. I also have faith in my experience, and my experience has shown me that I can't cope with emotions and yeah. that people don't want me to have them or express them, I should say. Personal experience. This is a great big cause of our so called what we really have faith in. Yeah. My personal experience is you are going to get abused more if you feel that's my that, and uh, pretty much everyone on earth has that personal experience it's very rare for a person to not have that and may i mention another movie i just saw captain phillips yeah. true story 
Exactly. Don't tell us the whole story. Okay. We haven't seen but it yet. It, it, it reminded me of Star Wars because essentially it was saying that they lost, that those with who are emotional are weaker. Yes. Yeah. 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 And it's very true. There is this very large belief on the planet, isn't there, that if you're emotional, you're weak. Yep. Yep. There we go, Dan. So these are the things we currently have faith in, uh, if we're honest with ourselves. I don't know if this is any different from beliefs, um, but this whole like faith in positive thinking. We have faith in our minds. Very good, yes. We have faith in our mind. What our mind tells us. The power of the mind. You see this coming out in almost every spiritual network that discusses anything spiritual. Always referring to the mind. I, we were uh, reading some stuff about, some Christians were saying about love, and they are actually saying that it's not a feeling. So there is even this belief that love is not a feeling. It's a mental construction, and it's a thought. <laughs> right? That's how addicted we are to this concept of the power of the mind. Just hugely addicted to it. So we could list more, of course. So, so can you see we've currently got faith in these things. So if you have faith in those things, where do you think your will is going to be exercised? Isn't it going to be exercised to support those things? Can you see that? And where do you think your humility will be exercised? Won't it be towards absorbing more of those things? See, wherever our faith is, that usually directs eventually our will, our desire, our passion. It directs even how we exercise humility. So what I see is some people are so humble when it comes to listening to a person who's talking about the mind and the power of the mind. You look at it on the earth at the moment. You, you might have 10,000 people go to a seminar of a person who talks to you about the power of the mind. 10,000 people. Why do 10,000 people go? Because they are humble because of they feel they are humble or in other words they are open to that belief. They are humble when it comes to talking about the mind but when you start talking about the soul and emotions how many people are humble then? You don't have tens of thousands of people going along to those seminars. Right? Because that's in a completely different direction to what we've been or what, where our faith is. So the reality is, is where our faith is, is where we're going to use our will and where we're going to exercise humility. So, so if I'm a scientist and I have faith that I can discover a new scientific invention, I am going to be very humble to any idea or concept that helps me discover that new invention. In other words, I'm humble only where I'm directing my faith. I will direct my will in that direction. I will absorb information. You know, I'll be reading left, right and centre, everything I can possibly find to justify where I have faith. So if I have faith in a new scientific invention, I'll be reading all of the current ideas about those kind of concepts and, and I'll be thinking about it all the time. I'll be open to spirit influence in that particular direction all the time because that's where my faith is. So at the moment, our faith is in this. So where do you think our will is going to be exercised? It's going to be exercised in holding on to my addictions, holding on to my beliefs, holding on to my self-reliance, holding on to the society definition of what's right and what's wrong and what's loving and what's not loving, holding on to the fact that my personal experience backs up all of this evidence. I'll hold on to all of that and that's where I'll use my will. So when somebody comes along and says, the, talks to you about the power of the mind, the power of self-reliance, stop being a victim, you know, those kind of talks, thousands of people go along to those kind of talks. Because all of those kind of talks support where we have faith. But when somebody starts talking about God doing the opposite way around of what everything is, now very few people come along because they don't have faith in it. Even if it sounds good, they still don't have faith in it because their faith is telling them the opposite thing. 
It makes sense, doesn't it? So the problem with the, all of this is that our belief systems determine the fact that we don't want to know or feel our addictions. And our belief systems also determine where we place faith. And because we place faith in these things, we only use our will to get those things met. And we only exercise humility when those things come up. And everywhere else, we're in resistance. We're not humble. We're closed. We're closed mind, closed heart to any opposite concept. So when somebody comes along and tells us that the truth is actually different to that, <laughs> most of us are going to go, that's a stupid idiot idea. Right? The truth isn't different to that. This has been my personal experience. This is what the truth is. Most of us will do that. And love is just a thought anyway. So what's the point of feeling about that? Because you can only think love. You can't feel it. And also, when somebody tells you that your concept of love is completely the opposite of God's, there's a feeling in you going, no, it's not. I live in this. If God created this so-called world that we live in, this is, if so-called God created this world that we live in, then I would suggest that the world we live in has taught me that addictions are king. So if you're telling me that God's the opposite of that, then God didn't do a very good job of creating this world, in my opinion. Right? And for the majority of people, they feel very, very disconnected from God as a result. Right? Because they feel that if what, I, if what Jesus is saying is true, then I'm just angry with God. <laughs> for doing what God did. Right. So, can you see one of the first things we're going to have to start doing if we're going to change this process? We're going to have to start deconstructing where we're placing our faith and reconstructing it in the appropriate direction. And this is our primary problem. It's the deconstruction process that takes forever, or it feels like it takes forever for most of us. Right? And so most of us go, well, at that process of deconstructing this, not only is it pointless, because what I currently believe is definitely right, but it's also going to take forever, given the fact that we live in a world that thinks completely the opposite of what we're trying to deconstruct. Right? The, the world is the same as these things. So if I try to deconstruct it, I will be completely opposite to the world then. Right? That's a problem. That's a big problem. If I'm ever going to be happy, it's a big problem. And so we have no motivation to even exercise our will in a different direction. And this is why the majority of you who have listened for a long period of time are struggling. Does that make sense? This is why you're struggling. Because there's this internal feelings inside of all of these f belief systems that you have faith in and you do not see any reason for giving them up internally. Now, I asked the question, how do you do it then? Well, the answer is going to sound very trite and, and basic, actually. <laughs> Remember the feelings that we said the belief that were all belief systems. So can you remember what some of them were? There's a feeling of hopeless. It's hopeless. It's dangerous. To, it's impossible. It's futile. I suppose that's the same as hopeless. Not necessary, yeah. Cruel and wrong. <laughs> right, these are some of the belief systems that we have about having to feel and give up our addictions. Right, these are some of the belief systems. 
we have to feel those feelings before those feelings will go away. So the only way to change our faith is to feel the belief systems that are the opposite to our faith. So you know what we do instead of that? We tell ourselves, I should be trusting God. Instead of feeling like, I don't trust God at all. all right? We tell ourselves that it's not hopeless, even though we feel it's hopeless. We tell ourselves that it's not dangerous, even though, from our personal experience, we believe it's dangerous. We tell ourselves that it's not impossible. But in our feelings, when we were a child, we felt it was impossible. Do you see what we're doing? We're intellectually telling ourselves, and this is what's happening for many people who come along to sessions and listening to Divine Truth. They're hearing all these things I'm saying about the positive side, about God and truth and all these kind of things, love and all those kind of things. And then they intellectually start telling themselves a message that their soul doesn't agree with. And then they wonder why they can't feel the emotion. The only way you're going to get through this stage, this stage of stagnancy, is to actually feel some of these feelings. When you feel the hopeless feeling right the way through to the end, you will no longer feel it's hopeless. When you feel the dangerous feeling right the way through to the end, you will no longer feel it's dangerous. When you feel that it's impossible feeling right to the end, you will no longer feel it's impossible. When you feel that not, it's not necessary, it's not the right thing to do, right to the end, you'll realise it is the right thing to do. It is necessary. When you feel the cruel, God's cruel and wrong wanting me to do this, right to the end, you'll no longer believe God's cruel and wrong. That's how you get rid of your false beliefs by feeling them it's the opposite of what most people want to do most people want to tell themselves the opposite belief rather than feel the actual belief they feel this is our primary problem our primary problem is that we need to actually feel the actual belief we have not the one that we're telling ourselves we want to have so I agree that many of you want to have a different belief system. But that's not helping you actually. Because you're telling yourself you have to have that belief system before you've felt the old belief system. Does that make sense? Mary? I remember um, also in this process of coming to confront my addictions, realising that the only, the, feel the only feelings that I was really comfortable with in the way I lived my life was to feel good through having an addiction met or to be numb. Yeah. That was the way I lived. And so I in other words, uh, the other, there's three options, wasn't there? There's pain, yep. feel good. Or be numb. Or numb. Yeah, and I realised I had almost zero tolerance for pain. So... so Priority system is going to be zero. <laughs> yep. No tolerance for pain. Feel good. Yeah, we go for that majority of the time. So most people were 50% or plus on wanting to feel good. Yeah, although I think we're kidding ourselves, but anyway. Oftentimes yeah. we are. And most of us would be at least 50% of, close to 50% of just numbing out half the time. Yeah. Yep. So I, I realised, and actually it kind of gets worse on this whole learning divine truth thing yeah. because you you begin to realize as you like introspect and look at your life and you begin to realize oh the only time i feel good is when i'm in my addictions and crap now i'm having more awareness it doesn't even feel that good anymore yeah. so <laughs> so now all of your feel good options <laughs> yeah have are gone, gone. <laughs> So where are most of us tempted to go then oh 80 to 90 numb 100% numb yeah <laughs> This is where some of you have even gone, yes, yeah, since yeah. you've become, you know, learnt divine truth, yeah? 100% yeah. none. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, feel it's... worse than you felt when you began. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I remember realising that I was going to have to feel discomfort 
pain, you know, to feel uncomfortable in my own skin if I was going to actually confront addiction. Yeah. And I was going to have to... Um, it's linked with what you were just saying. I'm sorry. It's um, okay. I lost it. Can I just point out some things about spirit influence in amongst all this yeah. as well? So feeling good, most for most of us, is all about our addictions, is it not? In our addictions, we attract people who feed our addictions or who confront them and spirits who feed our addictions or who confront them. Okay? Don't we? When we go numb, what do we attract? Spirits and people. Spirits who basically want to just take over our entire life and people who want to take over our entire life. That's what we attract. So what is the more dangerous thing? <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but I feel that's pretty dangerous and that's pretty dangerous. From God's perspective, if you choose to feel that properly, like really own your feelings, if you choose to feel your pain, that is the least dangerous option in terms of what will happen in your future through law of attraction. But none of us believe that. We believe that it is the most dangerous option. Why do we believe that? Because in our childhood, that was our experience. So we believe it because it was our experience as a child. But if you think about it, as a child, we did not have a full exercise of our free will because our parents and, and others controlled our will. Now, as an adult, we have free will. As a child, we couldn't remove ourselves from our family. We couldn't remove ourselves from the negative projections of our family. But as an adult, we can. Even if it's temporary, we can do it. Right? Can you see that many of us are still thinking as children? This is what happens with these childlike beliefs that get established before our brain has developed, is that we finish up feeling as a child feels even though we're in an adult body we still think the same way as we thought then we still feel the same way as we felt then and that's because we've not released any of those beliefs from ourselves so we carry them around so basically most of us are children in an adult's body thinking that we have no way to get away when we do thinking that we have no way to to a degree control our experience of release but we do because we're an adult now we do we have some way we have some self-determination now whereas when we were a child we had none or very little so so many of our belief systems are still like we're a child still we're still thinking like we're three-year-olds in a lot of ways with regard to our emotional experience and that's understandable given the fact that these emotions are still within us so if we look at those three things that Mary brought up of pain, pleasure basically we could call the other one, shall we? And numb. Right, those three. Can you see where you're choosing to go? The majority of the time. Reflect upon it. Where are you choosing to go the majority of the time? The majority of us will find that we're always trying to seek for pleasure or be numb. Most of us have a deep avoidance of our true pain. Now, if we look at our, some of our most painful emotions, and this is why it's hard to get a start on the way to God. The reason why it's hard to get a start on the way to God is that our most painful emotional experiences are going to be the first ones we feel. Right? For many of us, that's the case. And there, of course, the way God's made it is that actually right at the end, you'll feel your most painful ones. But you believe that your first ones are going to be most painful. And for the majority of people, that's how it works out. Because they find that most of these reasons why they want their addictions are all related to childhood beliefs. And giving up childhood beliefs are some of the most difficult beliefs to ever give up. Will you think of just a simple belief like Christmas? 
childhood belief. Most people learn that Santa Claus comes through your chimney and leaves you a present in a stocking, uh, you know, under the fireplace if you've got one. And, uh, and most of us believe that two, three, four, five years of age. And then some child at school tells us that's not true. How many, how many parents even get angry with that child telling their child that it's not true? The deconstruction of a myth there's a lot of general rage about. Right? Why? Because childhood beliefs we often f feel as the most painful sets of beliefs. And they often are the most painful sets of beliefs. They are born before we even had an intellectual ability to evaluate them. And so they are going to be quite emotional. And this is why many people still teach their own children as an adult that Santa Claus comes through the chimney. They, they actually lie to their child. They'd rather do that than deconstruct their link inside of their own child to that belief. Even though they know it's intellectually, they know it's wrong now, but they still want their child to believe it. It's pretty weird, eh? Wanting your child to believe something false because it brings you pleasure rather than pain that's the only reason why right and this is what we do with most of our childhood beliefs even once we realize they are a myth in our mind we still continue to perpetrate them in our feelings isn't that interesting so even our mind doesn't deconstruct the false belief and this is why a lot of the painful false beliefs of our childhood are going to have to be released, but the only, there's only one way they can be released. They can't be released by you telling yourself something different. And this is what many of you are trying to do. You're trying to tell yourself something different. Many of you don't have faith in God. You don't have faith in emotion. You don't have faith that anything like that will actually work. You don't we need to be honest about that and say we just don't our emotional experience from the childhood belief systems are that as a child we had an experience which tends to suggest to us and often violently suggest to us that it's impossible to feel your emotions without having danger uh, violence pain suffering and many other things uh, that we will continue to attract for the rest of our life most of us believe that we believe it in our heart the only way that belief is going to leave us is to feel it. It's the only way it can leave us. It's not going to leave you just by trying to accept a different belief in your mind. It can't leave you that way. It's not going to. The only way a childhood belief is released is by feeling the belief. Right? And that is the problem. The problem we have is that most of these childhood beliefs we totally believe are true. So why would you go and feel them? Why would you go and feel them to release them? We totally believe they're true. And, it's not, and so somebody can come along and tell you, look, your whole life will change if you let go of these beliefs. And you go, no, it won't. Don't be stupid. How can my whole life change? This is reality of the universe we live in. This is reality of the world we live in. This is what it's like. You're telling me that it's not? Do you live in some kind of like, you know, la la land? You know, so, so of course now even when we had the media come to us, now they say, they, one, of the, one of the titles was Meeting Jesus and Mary in La La Land. But the reality is the majority of us feel that I'm in La La Land actually. The majority of you feel it in your soul does that make sense because your belief systems are telling you completely the opposite of what I'm telling you and that's why you don't believe so you can tell yourself that it all sounds nice you can come along because it all sounds nice but at the end of the day you feel more and more blocked up more blocked up more stagnant more blocked up because the only way forward is going to be to feel these childhood beliefs and sometimes when you feel them, you know you're also going to feel the age in which they were constructed. Do you realize that? 
Sometimes when you start feeling about one of the childhood beliefs, like for example, the childhood belief that you will get punished if you cry. That childhood belief. You feel that childhood belief and while you're feeling it, you will probably feel that you're going to get hurt. Even as an adult, you're going to feel that someone will come along and hurt you for crying. Make sense? Now I reckon we're going to have to do a battery swap. Just let me do that. Um, okay. So does everyone get what I'm saying there? How important this process is to actually feel your childhood beliefs. So you want to feel your actual childhood beliefs and not the ones you want to have now. Right? So, so many of you, because you have this, uh, you've heard a lot of divine truth now, right? You've heard a lot about the theories of divine truth is probably the way I'd like to say it to you. Because as yet, for many of you, it's not a practice. It's not something that's happening inside of your soul because of this problem, actually. Because there's an unwillingness to feel the childhood beliefs. But if you think about it, the only way that you can progress forward now is not by listening to more divine truth. That's not going to help you progress forward. The thing that will help you progress forward is to feel some of these childhood beliefs that you have, that you sincerely believe are true. Beliefs that I'm saying to you are not actually true. Does that make sense? Allow yourself to feel them, these beliefs that you have. That's all that's required. When you feel a belief to completion, it disappears from you. You see, these beliefs are trapped emotion within your soul. And any time you trap an emotion in your soul, it determines your belief systems. So if, we, if you think about it from this perspective, if this is you, the person, your body, right? There's a flow of energy that flows through your body. But when you have a certain belief system that's out of harmony with love, it's like a ball of emotion that gets trapped somewhere in your body. Does that make sense? So let's say it's the belief system that I am worthless. Because that's what my parents taught me. That's a belief system of my childhood. That is like a trapped feeling in my body. Now any energy or any experience that comes to me will pass through me and hit that belief. And that belief will colour every single experience. And not only that, the way God's made the law is that we will attract events to help us trigger that particular emotion that exists there as well. So that means that not only does any experience feel, make us feel that we're worthless, but we are going to attract experiences that make us feel like we're worthless so that we can release the emotion, right? Now, if this emotional blockage here is released and it was caused when I was three years old, then I'm probably going to be feeling three years old when I feel it. Right? Because it's a trapped emotional experience, it's a trapped feeling of that age that was created by an experience. So you, when you feel it, you will feel the experience and probably in the end the age of the experience through the process. Now, this trapped emotion is what blocks us from any different truth from entering us. So you can tell yourself over and over, you can tell your mind, I am worth, I am worth something, I am worth something, I am worth something. But as soon as somebody treats you a certain way, you go, you're treating me like I'm worthless and, I'm, and you're angry and everything. Why is that? Because you actually feel you're worthless, otherwise you wouldn't get so angry. Right? Automatically, we revert to the emotion. Automatically. Because... Whatever you tell your mind is not going to change you. Now, we have historical proof of this single fact. You look at almost every religious faith, every religious faith almost says it was constructed for the point of love. right? And yet, when you look at the results of most religious faiths, what do you see? Violence instead. You look at the history of the Christian religion, mostly violent. The history of the Muslim religion, mostly violent. The history of most religions are mostly violent. Right? 
And the reason for that is, is that we have these beliefs in us that all we've got to do is trigger them and whatever was in our mind. So you can even have a Buddhist belief that, you know, you should love everybody and Zen out, love everybody. But as soon as the emotion is triggered, bang, you don't love anybody anymore. You feel angry and you want to kill somebody. And, and this, is the, this is the problem with this concept that you can change your mind. Your mind is only capable of changing when there is no emotional impediment to the change. And while you have a soul-based belief system in your soul that's existed from the time of two, three, four years of age, nothing you tell your mind is going to get to your soul about that particular belief if it's contrary. The only way for that to for only way for change to occur, even in your own mind, is that that belief system is rubbed out from your soul by experiencing it. The, when we start experiencing it, we start dribbling it out. Oops, that looks a bit like a... <laughs> looks a bit like a wee there. We start dribbling it out. Right? And when we dribble the emotion out, we are now in the process of changing the belief. Right? And once you imagine, as you dribble it out, obviously the emotion starts coming out, starts coming out, and more and more of it comes out, and eventually it disappears. Once it disappears, if somebody tells you you are worthy, can you see your mind now has the capacity to absorb it? But not only does your mind have the capacity to absorb it, now your soul has the capacity to absorb it. Because there is not an opposing emotion within your soul. Does it make sense? Right. Now, so the only way we can progress forward is by feeling the false belief of our childhood, which we believe is true. That's the only way to progress forward. That is what the majority of people who have heard divine truth are not doing. They hear divine truth and they go, so I've got to tell myself that I'm worthy. But God's way is, feel that you're unworthy first and then you'll be able to tell yourself you're worthy and it will actually enter you. <laughs> Does that make sense? So we're trying to skip over the unworthy feeling because it's, as was pointed out earlier, it's, painful so we, in our attempt to avoid our pain we only want to feel good or we want to be numb we don't want to feel the pain but the emotional belief that I'm unworthy is a painful emotional belief so instead of feeling that pain we tell ourselves the way to change is to not feel that pain which results in the pain remaining within our soul like a big black gooey muck in this case right it remains within our soul and we tell ourselves that it's going to be too painful to experience that emotion but the problem is no matter what belief system enters us it will never fully enter us because it cannot while that belief, opposite belief exists that opposite belief will determine everything that happens and you can listen to divine truth for 20 years and you will make no change unless you choose to experience some of this childhood pain. No change can actually happen. Yeah. Mary? Uh, I'm hoping you can help me to explain a feeling that I'm having about this. Yeah. That is, again, from my experience. When I didn't challenge the childhood belief with any truth, mm -hmm. with any divine truth, mm -hmm. I lived in it and mm -hmm. it directed my life. So, so you're saying if there was no challenge mm -hmm. of the false belief, shall we call the childhood belief now? Yeah. And remember the false belief, even though it's false from God's perspective, you think it's true. So it's, it's a belief you believe is true, even though God knows it's false. Okay. So when I didn't challenge it, it directed my life. I had I created more and more addictions yes. to 
Because you, know, you now live in. Yeah. So the the feeling of the hope, false belief, the hopelessness, for example. I yeah. had hopelessness, and so I just lived in this false belief. Yeah. And then I heard divine truth. Yes. And then I tried to feel childhood pain. Yeah. In order to avoid hopelessness. In other, in order, in order to avoid the false belief that was inside of you. Yes. Yeah, that's very complicated, isn't it? It, it is. Because it doesn't work. It doesn't work yeah. at all. And that's why, I'm, that's why I want to bring it up. I'm like, yeah. don't do this one. It's not, <laughs> it doesn't work. There's this other thing that we can do, which is to remember divine truth and let it, the only way I can think of describing it is like letting it buffet or confront at the false belief that's living inside of me. Correct. So uh, now what works for me is to say, I know this is truth, yep. so, but my God, I don't feel it. I feel and Can I even hopeless. revise that? Yeah. The reality is whatever you hear, you don't know is true until you feel it. So stop telling yourself, like, I hear conversations between people who have heard divine truth for years and they say, I know that God loves me. You know, you'd be better off saying, I have no idea God loves me actually. Mm -hmm. The feeling I have is that I've got no idea God loves me. And what you think you know, you don't know until you feel, right? And unless you feel God loves you, you don't know. So stop telling yourself you know when you're not feeling it. Does that make sense to everyone? Just tell yourself the truth. The mm -hmm. truth is, I don't feel God loves me. Feel that. That's the false belief that needs to be felt. Yeah, because I see people hearing it and then saying, I don't feel God loves me, but if I feel some pain about this one little thing that happened and have a cry, then, then I'll get God's love and I'll avoid this huge whopping great feeling, which is I don't feel that feel God loves me. me. So and how can, how can there be a true prayer for God's love while inside of yourself you have a feeling that God doesn't love you? You're not going to feel that you want God's love if you feel God doesn't love you. That's reality, isn't it? Like, do you want to get love from someone who you believe doesn't love you in the first place? Of course not. Yeah, so it's sort of like how I see and I know I tried to do it trying to feel things in order to avoid these great whopping black kind of feelings. false beliefs well, feelings they're feelings childhood from our childhood feelings. of like God yeah. is not real I am alone, it is hopeless all of those ones yes. and it's only since I started feeling those ones that any things, progress gets made Yeah, happened. Yeah. spot on yeah. and this is what I feel the majority of people still don't understand is that unless you choose to actually feel the feeling that is the false belief inside of you, you will not, no matter how much you try, change anything. You will not change anything. And the reason, there is a good reason for that, is that the soul is made in such a way that while a false belief resides within you, it first must be released in order for the truth to enter. Now, I ha my, and Mary have done a whole series of interviews, and I did some with Luli, about how the human soul functions. Some of you would have seen those, right? My suggestion is to go over and over and over and over and over those. Because how the human soul functions is that nothing new can enter your soul. It can enter your head, but not your soul, until the opposite belief on the same subject is released from your soul. And the way it, a, a belief gets released is to feel it. That's how it gets released. The only reason why it's still within you is because it wasn't felt at the time. So when you were ch children and you had this terrible feeling that you, weren't, you were worthless, you weren't allowed to feel it. Your parents did all sorts of things to shut that down. They either told you you are worthy when you didn't feel you were or they reinforced that you're not through their actions towards you. Right? They stopped you from feeling the emotion. And it's only by feeling the emotion that you'll release it. You can only release emotions 
you can't release beliefs any other way that's God's way does that make sense God's way is that you must release the underlying cause of your false belief and that is a feeling it's not a thought most of these feelings got created before you even had your developed mind so that should tell you that they aren't thoughts they're feelings that are controlling you feelings that are, uh, that you believe are true but from God's perspective are actually false but you believe they're true because that has been the truth of your experience in this life and you need to feel the truth of your experience in this life if you are ever going to progress everyone get that now I think that's probably a good place to stop for the moment because that's I feel in fact that in some ways that's probably all we need to talk about today because because what I would love you to experiment with now is actually listing down what you actually feel from your childhood so what I would encourage you to do is to make some lists of what you actually feel from your childhood rather than what you want to believe from your childhood is that you see the difference make a list of what you actually feel that you know you actually feel so for example if you actually feel things like that God doesn't love me write that down God doesn't love me God never rescued me write that down I wanted rescue God never rescued me mum hated me write that down dad you know couldn't give us stuff whether I lived or died write that down right whatever you feel these are the feelings that are opposing the truth from entering your soul so the best thing to do is to write them down right and then what we can do is start seeing the relationship between those feelings and the addictions you've created to make those feelings go away does that make sense do you start to see okay to get rid of this dad doesn't love me feeling what I finished up doing as I grew up is I wanted every man who ever met to love me and what I finished up doing you know, if, I, if I'm a woman what I finished up doing was projecting sexually at them you know having sex with them so they'd give me a cuddle afterwards and that way I'd feel a bit of love right and that's the reason you know that's one of the things I did just because I, I really feel like dad didn't love me and I did, did it for that reason and you see the relationship between what you've been doing in your addiction and what feeling from your childhood you've been avoiding in that process you see now Mary and I do this very frequently because it's not always easy to just feel in the moment right sometimes you've got to allow yourself through a process to become aware of the actual belief that's inside of you and unless you're aware you're not going to feel it so if you're trying to shut it down and not be aware at all you're not going to feel anything there so so allow yourself to become aware so this is what I suggest is our next question that we want to ask ourselves okay what have I done actually I might put two here I'm sorry for those of you who've already written that down number one um, what do I believe from my childhood That's number one what do I believe from my childhood because remember it's the false beliefs or the actual beliefs from your childhood that are false from God's perspective 
that have to be felt before you can release them. Now the thing that's preventing us from releasing these false beliefs is our addictions. So the second question is, what do I do to avoid feeling the childhood belief can you see the relationship so here is what do I believe and be honest with yourself as you know this is a personal exercise it's pointless trying to say it tell yourself I believe God loves me when the feeling inside of you is I believe God hates me you know so write down as many that you come to your mind you know what do you believe about your mum really what do you believe about your dad really what do you feel what did you feel from them really what do you think you felt from them? it doesn't matter if you, they actually did it even what was the result inside of you that caused you to feel these particular things allow yourself to be honest and truthful about them what do I believe from my childhood and what do I do now basically to avoid feeling that childhood belief so let's say I believe that I'm always alone might be one of my childhood beliefs because when I was a child I was always left alone and nobody ever took any notice of me nobody ever listened to me I finished up reading most of my life away when I was a child uh, you know I hardly had any friends I was always alone so that might be my belief so what do I do now to avoid that belief avoid the feeling of it so what do I do now to avoid feeling alone, in other words? Does that make sense? And you might find yourself that you spend a lot of time in people's company, you go out to watch movies, you play video games, you, you know, all of these things to keep you busy, keep yourself busy, you do a lot of exercise, you know, just to avoid the feeling of being alone. Does that make sense? And when you look back at your life, you might find, in fact, while you felt alone as a child, you might find that as an adult you've never been alone for longer than a day many adults find that you know they've left one relationship and within a day they've found another uh, often it's that intense that we go from one relationship to another to another to another to another in a moment in moments just to avoid a feeling in fact some people tee up the next relationship before they leave the next, last one in other words, they get the next one started before they leave the last one so they don't have to feel alone in between. Right? So, so we need to ask ourselves these two questions, I feel. And what I would love to discuss with you the next time you and I get together, which will be uh, Wednesday, uh, probably, is I would like to discuss these two things, what you found out during this process. What, see here, these, I would put in brackets as to what these are, these are your addictions. Does that make sense? They are the things that you've created in order to avoid these things, these painful things. So the first one's the beliefs and the second one is the addictions, basically, that help you avoid feeling the truth of that belief. And when I say the truth of that belief, what you believe to be true inside of yourself so many of you believe inside of yourself that you're worthless so what have you done to avoid the feeling of feeling worthless right. for, for, for some of you it would be oh, I've projected at every man because my feeling of worthless comes from my f not having a father I projected at every man may, find me sexually attractive in order to <laughs> validate me that's one of the ways that I get my feeling of worthlessness overcome to does that make sense so that's my addiction my addiction is project sexually get a sexual response now I feel valid I don't have to feel that my daddy didn't love me I feel men all, all men love me <laughs> that's the feeling right and I'm bartering I'm I've got these addictions in play most addictions by the way are codependent you've heard of that term that means that you're doing something to please someone else and getting something in response back to you most addictions form a codependence codependency good day so do you reckon you can have a go have a stab at that exercise
remember the underlying goal of this exercise is to show you what is covering over your childhood belief systems. So if I drew a little map of that, basically this is what it looks like. Here are your childhood beliefs that you do not wish to feel. These are also, you could classify as your fears. Can you see that? You could classify them as your fears. And over the top of that, to stop you from having to feel those, you've created a whole set of actions, thoughts, people, places, things, and I could list many other things which we'll go through when we start talking about our addictions, to suppress double P, the having to feel those emotions. And these are called your addictions. So in other words, you created a whole series of addictions and their purpose, their primary purpose of all of your addictions is to suppress or push down the emotions that form your childhood belief systems that are painful. Does that make sense? That's the purpose of them. So the addictions are suppressing your childhood beliefs. So if we're going to unravel this process that occurred in our childhood, we're going to need to feel about and acknowledge and even be able to intellectually identify, probably before we acknowledge, if we can intellectually identify these childhood belief systems and start to feel them, what do we find then? We start to feel the reasons why our addictions got created. And once we start seeing the relationship, we can start going, okay, here are my childhood belief systems that I do need to eventually feel, but what I need to do is also see what addictions that I've created that push them down from being felt. The things that control them from being felt. The things that help me avoid them being felt. Right? And once, I'm doing, once I understand the relationship, I can go, okay, here's my addiction in play again. So I might be out doing something, you know, here's my addiction in play. Like, let's look at a very simple addiction. Most of the time I might feel cold. That's the childhood feeling. Right? Just cold. I always feel cold. I always feel cold. That's my childhood feeling. What do I do now to make this cold go away? You know, I turn up the air conditioner to 80. Right? My whole family complains. It's all too hot in here. It's all too hot in here. No, it's not. It's comfortable, you know. There's all these family-based arguments about the fact that I've got the air conditioner turned up. Just a simple addiction to get over this childhood feeling that you're cold. Just one simple feeling. What does cold make you feel? Fear and alone and a lot of other types of feelings, right? That's why you turn the air conditioner up. That's why you got it set at 80. Right? And you'll start seeing that there's physical things you do there's emotional things you do, there's spiritual things you do, there's sexual things you do in order to avoid these childhood feelings. And you'll start seeing the relationship then between them. And what we're attempting to do through this process is deconstruct the process that was created so that we can at least start to get to the feeling of these childhood beliefs. That's our goal, to f eventually feel them. We want to feel them. Because if we don't feel them, we will never release them. So our whole goal in this process is to try to get to feeling them. You're not going to be able to feel them initially because you've got all the addictions pushing down the feeling. Does that make sense? But we've at least got to identify some of these childhood belief systems, these childhood feelings, and what we do to keep them under control, to keep them under wraps. We've got to do that. Because if we don't do that, what we're going to do is never feel them. And remember, 
you grow by releasing the thing that it, and the only way to release it is by feeling it and then a new feeling can enter you or a new truth can enter you or new faith can enter you you see at the moment as we listed even our faith is all upside down at the moment we've got faith in everything that God says is untrue and faith in nothing that God says is true and the only way to deconstruct that process is by feeling some things we're going to have to feel what is the untruth that we believe is true and the only way our faith will change is by feeling something we've got to understand everything is going to be solved through feeling something at some point we've even got to get to that belief at the moment most of us don't even believe that can you see most of us believe you feel something you're going to get in trouble feel something dangerous feel something it's going to get hopeless feel something it's going to go over and on forever feel something that's our beliefs so let's know what those beliefs are and let's look at what we do to keep those beliefs from being felt what actions we take just simple actions to complicated actions that we take to avoid the feeling does everyone see the relationship so I'm sorry to labor that point if I was laboring it for you but I wanted you to understand why we're going through this process and why we're we trying to go through this process this is a process that Mary and I do every single day right every single day we go through this process of looking at what our childhood feelings and beliefs are and looking at what addictions we have that suppress that because then we can start deconstructing our addictions and once we deconstruct our addictions what's going to probably happen the feeling will just come up naturally the feeling will just pop out because we've de deconstructed enough addictions to enable the feeling to come out while you're living in your addictions no feelings will come out it's a very important thing to understand while you're living in your addictions no feelings will come out so the only way to have feelings come out and remember that it's the feelings coming out that heal you the feelings coming out change you so you have to have feelings coming out before change will actually happen but the only way that is going to happen is by you deconstructing the addictions enough so that the feelings can just pop out just like that and that is just like that oftentimes like you can go you can go on for months and months and months deconstructing addictions and you think well this is not getting me anywhere I still feel much the same thing and then all of a sudden you're bawling your eyes out and you don't have any idea why and then you know a, a day later you feel completely different and that's generally how most people experience change with regard to accepting God's truth does that make sense the feelings just pop out when you've done enough work to to look at your addictions now can I point out to you why this is the case your addictions are the exercise of your will to deny that's what addictions are addictions are the exercise of your will to deny your childhood emotional experiences so can you see why it's so much a part of receiving God's love if you're exercising your will to deny and God's love is trying to expose rather than deny can you see you're exercising your will in direct opposition to what God's love would do that's why we need to come face to face with our addictions at some point because our addictions are the exercise of our own personal will in a direction that's completely opposite to growing in love and truth it's the way we're saying to God no I'm not doing it your way I'm doing it my way this is my way this works I know this works from my past experience I'm not changing and there's the exercise of your will the exercise of your will. there's your prayer your prayer is don't you change me I know what's right that's your prayer 
That's your actual prayer. Remember, it doesn't matter what you think you're praying. What matters is what's coming out of your heart, your soul. And if what's coming out of your soul is, no, I want to maintain these addictions because they're the only things I believe in. And that's what's coming out of your soul. That's the prayer that you, God hears. God hears you don't want to confront your childhood emotional experience. So God says, no worries. I'll try and find some alternative way to help you confront your childhood emotional experience. Right? And God constructed a whole heap of laws, law of cause and effect, law of attraction, many other laws, all to help construct, you know, get to your childhood emotional experience. And now you've got to rely on all them. And most of us don't even rely on them. We're, we're trying to avoid them too, right? So, so this is what we need to understand is that our addictions are the exercise of our will to deny. So the more you can reduce your addictions, the more you're expressing your will to no longer deny. Eventually it becomes such a big prayer within you that, that you notice them very, very rapidly and they disappear because you're willing to feel what created them very rapidly. Eventually that's what happens. Uh, but it's not going to happen without you changing the direction of your will. And that's why I suggest to go through this process. It's a process that Mary and I go through, as I said, all the time. We're just constantly looking. We know that whenever we exercise our will to deny, that's what restricts our growth. 